Welcome very much to the uh, BRC Open Day Debate. Um, good to share data, research, privacy in the NHS. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Mark Sheehan. I'm the Oxford BRC Ethics Fellow and I'm your David Dimbleby, theoretically at least. We'll see how that works. Um, the, the format of the debate is we have our esteemed panellists here who will have something to say about the questions that we want to ask. Um, and, but we do want to make this interactive, so we are looking for you to ask questions about things that concern you and about things that you feel our panellists haven't addressed properly. Um, the way in which we do that is I'll keep an eye out for you putting your hand up and then I'll try to fit you in or acknowledge your question, um, as, at, at least acknowledge your question and try to come back to you if I can. So if you could be bear with me. And then uh, Cora and Paul, I believe, are coming around with the mics. If you could speak into the mic very closely, that would be great. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> how patients' data is handled it used to be quite simple. 20 to 30 years ago, information about yourself, your medical history, and treatments would be kept in a paper folder and left to, another, uh, left, left to gather dust on a shelf. The advent of computing in everyday life, everything has changed. Now data can be shared around the world with a single click and put through complex computer programs with other patients' data to analyse trends to support research and ultimately improve patient care. In hospitals, anonymised data has been used for research for many years. So, for example, if you spent four days in, a hospital, after, in hospital after stroke, that number could be added without your name to all the other length of stays for stroke to study how best to provide stroke care. In some cases, where your name could be accessed, you'll be asked for permission to allow your data to be used for research. You may also remember there was a proposal for GPs to share anonymised data without patients express consent two years ago, which is currently on hold pending the outcome of a review. But the ability to access and share patients' data, need, patients data needs is an issue that, while has excited many people from the medical community, has led to questions and concerns from others. We're hoping this debate will clarify some of these issues and provide some food for thought to help you reach your own conclusions. The aims of today are to think about a number of questions. What are the benefits of sharing data? Should you give your consent for your data to be shared? When should you be asked to give consent for your data to be shared? Who should have access to your data? And is your data safe and secure? Good. So our panellists, I'm very, uh, very glad to have this, this group of people assembled here on the stage with me. Um, to my right, far right, is Jim Davies. Jim is the informatics lead for the Oxford NHS Genomic Centre, which was set up in 2014 to lead the government's 100,000 Genomes Project in Oxfordshire and the surrounding area. He's also the chief technical officer for the 100,000 Genomes Project uh, nationally. The 100,000 Genomes Project will involve collecting 100,000 genomes, funnily enough, complete sets of DNA from patients and their families to analyse and better understand some cancers and rare diseases. <coughs> also to my, to my immediate right is Martin Landry, Deputy Director of the University's Oxford Big Data Institute, a new facility that's being constructed at the Old Road campus at the Churchill Hospital and is expected to open at the end of the year. The centre will study large amounts of data, including genetic, clinical, imaging and mobile sensor data on hundreds of thousands of NHS patients to help researchers better understand disease. To my immediate left is Federica Luciviera. She's Marie Curie Fellow at the Social Science Health and Medicine Department at King's College London. Her current project investigates the ethical challenges of digital technologies in healthcare, specifically looking at the mobile apps and personal health records. Currently, she serves as KCL representative in the European Commission Working Group that has the mission to draft guidelines for the assessment of health app quality. And to my far left is Carol Moore. She's the Executive Director of Healthwatch Oxfordshire, a statutory organisation that exists to strengthen the collective voice of patients and the public so that service providers and commissions listen to what they have to say. They then hold health and social care providers and commissions to account on how they use public feedback to shape, inform and influence service delivery and design. So if you join me in welcoming them to the stage, that would be great. Thank you.
Right, to begin, it's probably useful, I think, to get on the table our first question and to get some sort of sense of why this interest in data sharing and, and data use. So I'll ask Martin if you wouldn't mind starting off by um, giving us some reasons why we think, what are the benefits for data sharing? Okay, well, thank you very much and, and it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, I think it's worth taking a perspective about what we're trying to do in medicine. I mean, medicine has always been a specialty that tries to balance decisions based on observations and data along with the sort of personal considerations of preference, need and choice. And my career to date has actually uh, encapsulated both elements of that. On a Wednesday morning, I see a single patient, one at a time, in the, in the cardiology clinic here in the hospital. Uh, the rest of the week, I study large numbers of patients, hundreds of thousands at a time, in order to try and understand causes of disease, uh, treatments for diseases, uh, and how we might uh, prevent disease and improve health overall. One thinks back, there's a long history of getting good value out of data, uh, disease outbreaks and the effect effectiveness of vaccination, treatment of blood pressure and cholesterol to reduce heart disease, choice of surgery, radiotherapy or chemotherapy to treat breast cancer, and the safety and hazards of many drugs and other interventions all come from data. Without data and data on large numbers of people, one wouldn't have meaningful information on those important elements of healthcare. I think what has evolved is the new opportunities uh, uh, that have come about by the increasing use of high throughput technology. Now, perhaps in one, at one level, and Jim will probably argue with this, uh, the lowest technology piece in all of this is the electronic healthcare record. It is traditionally a convert from the paper-based record, which we all recognize, uh, through to uh, simply an electronic enactment of that paper-based record. And so in some ways, many of the issues are very similar to what you would see in paper-based records. But as we go forwards, I think there's much more power to that in that actually it becomes uh, more feasible to assess uh, standards of care and identify new treatments from those records and enhance that information with the modern innovations. So whole genome sequencing uh, now becoming feasible on, at large scale. Uh, the use of sensor data, uh, accelerometer data, activity monitors, um, cameras to look at uh, oxygen saturation, heart rate, all these sort of things, and to look at self-reported data and, of course, imaging data, bringing that together. I think our challenge, and I'll just finish here, is really how do we interpret those data and do it so in a responsible way. And what I'd argue is that that needs partnership. It doesn't just need partnership between patients and the people who, ca who care for them, although clearly that is absolutely essential. But also, it requires partnership beyond traditional medical science through to into engineering, computer science, high-level statistics, uh, and, and so on, new technologies, in order to be able to get the best value. And what I mean by that is the best information for patient care out of those data. And doing so in a responsible fashion that maintains trust is, I think, the critical element of this. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I ask you, Martin, can, just, just, for, just so that we have a, a, a sort of an example in our in sort of forefront of our mind, what would you say was, is a sort of good example for us to use to sort of think about any of the benefits that the data, the sharing of data is going to give us? Well, um, I guess if I think about um, the, new, the use of uh, genetic information for uh, informing the care of patients with... Uh, congenital forms of heart disease, that would be one example. A second example would be using genetic information uh, to, to inform the care of particular types of cancer and develop new treatments for cancer. And another would be in chronic disease management. So I have run a clinic where a, a large number of the patients have chronic cardiovascular diseases and many other diseases all at the same time. One patient is one person, it's not one disease. Um, and trying to monitor uh, how well those people are doing, how they improve, how they deteriorate, and how things change over time is one of the crucial elements for that. If I were able to combine the healthcare information I already have across the entire healthcare system, I have to say, with monitoring data, by which I mean uh, data on how much activity people are doing, how they're functioning at home, what levels of blood pressure, are really like when they're in the real world, not when they're in my clinic and they've suffered for the hospital car parking system. Those are the sorts of information that would actually inform care. So that yeah. chronic disease management is at one level low tech. This is not new medicine, but at well, another level is high tech. This is an entirely new way of conducting medicine. Great. Jim, did you want to 
And anything just about the benefits that we need to add? Is there some point? About the benefits of sharing data? Yeah. I, I, I think most people can... Um, I mean, we, we do spend a lot of time quite rightly concerned about the risks, and um, I'd probably be one of the angriest people in the room about that sort of stuff. I think it, it's, you know, we're right to be concerned, but we can also be reassured there's a lot going on. When it comes to the benefits, I, you know, it, it, it's not simply, you know, it, it's great to have the, the prospect of advances in, in the science, improvements in the service, that's pretty obvious, but they can also be personal. I mean, if, if I, I would like my, you know, if, if I end up in, the, in, in cardiology as a patient, I would like whoever is considering my case, and they're all very busy, to have immediate access to every piece of information that might help them make, make the right call. And, and that's, that's, you know, I'm, and what's more, I, you know, I want just, I want this information properly shared. I want the context shared as well. I want this partnership that Martin's talking about. I want it understood. I mean, and, and it, you know, I, I, I don't want any of it misinterpreted. I want I, not just a few facts shared. I, I, you know, I want, if someone's going to make a decision about whether to give me a drug or not, or some advice to give me, or recommendation about the course of treatment, I want them to have everything that could be relevant. I might not want other people to have that data, but I want Martin, or Keith, or anyone who's going to make a call on my health, I'm trusting them with my life, I want that data in front of them. So, that's a bit selfish, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, if, so if, I've got this, if I've got this right, then then the idea of the data, of data sharing and allowing, Jim, allowing your clinicians um, to have all of the data at hand is the reason, as I, the benefits are going to come from a different set of people having access to and being able to monitor and manage all of your patient data in a way that hasn't happened before or is, is, is novel. Is that, is that, am I got that kind of right? I was just adding that, you know, I mean, clearly, the, the difficult thing about giving the data to somebody else is that quite often, you know, you're taking the risk and they might get the benefit. I was pointing out that actually, you know, the more we get this partnership, this engagement, and the more we can get the proper constraints around the use of this data, you know, actually the benefits will come back to the individuals. We've seen this in, in the 100,000 Genomes program. There are people who... I don't know, some people in the room probably think rare disease is, well, they, they happen to somebody else, but there's a surprisingly high proportion of the population suffer. And my goodness, if you, if you look at, you know, it, obviously the, the NHS is happy to bear this burden, but I've sat with people and, and heard stories about how they have been from clinic to clinic to clinic. Um, I, one woman who was talking to me, you know, she'd, she'd had to give up her job because taking her child to try and get a diagnosis. And that information is shared with people who can show some light on what was wrong with her child. They now have a diagnosis. And that, that you know, it's not all science fiction. They're, they're stuff that can have an impact now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, we put away all our concerns about data sharing, but there are benefits directly to the patients. This isn't entirely altruistic. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. Car Carol, if I could ask you, so, so one of the things I mentioned at the outset was this, this uh, the two years ago, the use of the, the, all the care dot data stuff. And that, presumably, I think Jim has opened up this question about who should have access and these questions about access. Um, what do you think, how do you think that all played? Which, should we think about who should have access? I, I, th I think that was a communication disaster, really. Um, there's nothing wrong with sharing data. And in fact, what's the point of collecting data if you're not going to use it for something? But it's what it's being used for and who's, who it's being shared with. So I think when patients speak to us, what they find is that they really struggle to get access to their own records. And they, get, they really struggle to get access from their GP, from the hospital. And they think, well, what's so secret within those records that can't be shared? But at the same time, you're coming back to me and you're saying, well, you want me to share lots and lots of detail about myself with some nebulous identities out there that we haven't really said, what are these pharmaceutical companies, you know, and it, it's, 
how we tell people about what we're using. And it's exactly what we say, at what point do we consent and who do we consent? And I think at the outset, it should be laid out who you're able to consent to stuff to go to. Mm -hmm. And then if additional details are, you know, as your name or additional details are needed, then you can consent to particular research studies mm -hmm. that you think might be relevant. But I think it has to be, you know, very clear what we're consenting to from mm -hmm. the outset. And I think that's what the problem with care.data was. Right. Do you, do you think there's any limits in who should have access? To our data? Absolutely, and, and this is more personally, but also informed by what people tell me, is that the people with commercial interests, they're very worried about that. Mm. They're much more worried about that than you know if it's within a, um, a health research context that's non-commercial or within the National Health Service. I think there's there's a big divide there that people get worried about. about so by commercial interests, you mean? Well, it could be any, any company that's looking cool. to develop something. Yeah. Federica. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up because that's a very important issue. Um, I, I think we should be careful how we use language uh, in the sense that the word sharing is not value free, it's not you know, neutral. Uh, when we talk about sharing, we think about uh, you know, dividing something with somebody else out of solidarity. And you know, it is true, many patients are very, many of us are very willing to um, are really very willing to let people, researchers, use their data for, um, for research purposes that can help other people and themselves. Um, but this is not, I mean, this is also a commercial uh, initiative and it is important rather than, probably rather than speaking about sharing, we should uh, speak about um, accessing uh, data. And several people have been um, saying this, that uh, probably a better language would be uh, explaining how data is made accessible, by whom, to whom, for which purposes. Um, and I think clarifying this ambiguity and avoiding this ambiguity in language really can help also um, avoid uh, you know, situations of public distrust as the care.data case uh, showed. So, so you'd rather that we talk about it in terms of ac making data accessible rather than who has access? Yes, and also, you know, uh, talking about benefits. There are two types of benefits that we have been discussing here. One is the benefits of integrating data uh, across care setting for care purposes. Um, so this means that your a hospital consultant will have access to your GP records and you know this is this is like integrating data and another aspect is uh, having researchers having access uh, to your data for research purposes so these are two different instances and again I wouldn't talk about sharing here I would say I would talk about accessibility uh, to data mm -hmm. because as Carol was saying there are also Public, there are public institutes and there are commercial companies having access, which is not necessarily a bad thing, you know, but we have Google, IBM, pharma companies also doing research. Um, so the question is, you know, who has access to it? Great, thanks. You should hold on to that. Um, so we have a couple of examples of, of the kinds of people for whom our data might, it might not be acceptable to have it our data accessible to them. I think the person who lives down the street and knows Jim, Jim is not happy for him to have access to his personal data. And as Carol's pointed out, there's this concern about commercial institutions. So any other views about this? What do we think about this? Yes, yeah, sir. Um, if you just wait for the, the microphone to come. Thanks, Cora. Seems to me, my name is Tony Williamson, it seems to me it's a tragedy that with all the information that the GP surgeries hold about our whole records, that when my wife has rushed him to the A&E, they know nothing. And um, at the same time, um, another relative of mine uh, has now, or has some time ago, been um, uh, discovered to have tuberous sclerosis, which is a hereditary thing, I think. But clearly, the knowledge about that 
was around for years and years before they discovered it. And my sister, at my age, had um, uh, had epilepsy and things, which was obviously the beginning of it. And on the one hand, I feel that I, that, that I want my information to be available for me. On the other hand, with my sister's family, I feel that I wonder whether were that info were the information about her and her family available, whether they would have picked up this tumor sclerosis mm. thing a lot earlier, simply by being able to put two and two together and having to make four rather than five. Mm. Would you be just just what I mean? Are there any limits? Do you think? to who should have access to yours and your family's data? Where are you prepared to sort of draw the line anywhere? I don't worry, personally. Um, I, I've been in the public media for all my life, and I've never worried about people having my telephone number, email address, or, or what have you. Um, but I appreciate some people do. Mm. And personally, um, I'm quite happy. I, I trust people. I think most people who have goodwill, there are a few crooks around, but I think most people have goodwill, and, and personally, I prefer to take the risk. Mm. Mm. Anybody else? Yeah. Sorry, this is more of a data accessibility sharing um, controversy at the moment that I wanted to bring up just yeah, to sure. see what you all think. Um, as we speak, a tribunal is underway where Queen Mary, University of London, are appealing against the Information Commissioner's Office ruling that they must release anonymised patient data. The research in question is the £5 million publicly funded PACE trial from 2011 looking at potential treatments for myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Dr. Richard Smith, ex-editor of the British Medical Journal, states that these researchers are defending the indefensible and that the inevitable conclusion is that they have something to hide. Respected scientists and doctors from around the world, including Stanford University, have stated there are major problems with the PACE trial's design and presentation of results leading to seriously misleading claims about patient recovery rates. For example, I won't be long, a person could enter the trial with a physical function score of 65 out of 100, seen as severely disabled, deteriorate during the trial to 60 out of 100, yet still be classed as recovered. It is crucial that the data is subject to scrutiny and the true results are revealed, since this trial has had a huge influence worldwide on the way patients with ME, CFS are treated. My question is, how are patients and clinicians to trust healthcare recommendations if the data upon which they are based is purposely hidden? So, so the, if I could, if I could summarise that, the, the the problem is that the claim has been made that, that researchers won't disclose the data. Yeah. Now, are they claiming that this is because it's a breach of autonomy? Well, the first and the, and, the one sec, and the challenge is the challenge is that this is that they're falsified data or they're treating it corruptly. That? Yes, I mean, they came up with saying that the requests were, were vexatious, even for uh, requests from some uh, right. scientists. Then they talked about um, uh, keeping the privacy of individuals' data, and then that mm -hmm. was seen to be mm -hmm. uh, absurd. Now, we don't know, actually, what they're doing. They're obviously paying these lawyers to appeal. We don't know what basis. I think they're worried. The other okay, let's, scientific let's see what, researchers, they will let's see what everybody thinks. Well, but yeah. we need to have a debate. Yes. We need everybody to get, be able to see the data. Is you fancy having a go, Jim? Now, this is really a question for Martin, but I'm going to kick off. <laughs> um, if I, I, I will claim I don't have any sexual problems, but if, if I had engaged in a trial and I provided my sexual history to, to these researchers, I'd signed a consent form and they said, we're not going to give it to anybody. I'd, I mean, I'd, you, know, you, you might be right that an investigation is required here, but I do, do think there's a privacy issue. I wouldn't be very happy to have, oh, we're going to release all the patient level, the record level stuff so somebody can go through it. All that, you know, inherently, if somebody wished to, and if you want to validate it, you're going to have to go back to the individuals and their records. So I, I would caution you that I think there's a privacy piece around this. That, you know, uh, you might think ME's, you know, that's not a, not a, uh, so much of a stigma. But, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't. That's yeah, why no, we I'd need to get at the truth. Okay. Over to the professionals. 
Okay, so one of the things I do for a living is to run clinical trials. Um, I, I think the point you raise are really important. Um, I know nothing about this particular case at all, and I can't comment. And my, what I do say shouldn't be taken in the context of that trial because I know no, no details. I do think there are a number of issues that need to be considered. I think the very first one is what was the nature of the consent in the first place? Um, because I think uh, in the context of clinical trials, uh, uh, almost without exception, uh, a, a formal informed consent process approved by ethics committees and others is gone through. And it seems to me that then the primary responsibility from that point on is to uh, uh, uphold the terms of that consent. Now, there may be times that, like all uh, privacy issue or any other issue, where some other um, allegation of crime, if you like, or, or of, of poor behaviour somehow overrides that, but I think the starting should point should be the right of, that was, it, was, was put in the consent form in the first place. So that's step one. The second is that I think that there is a responsibility on the investigators, but there's a responsibility on the researchers and the research community to produce results that are robust and reliable. And there's a responsibility to be able to defend that against allegations that they are otherwise. That exactly how one does that might depend on the circumstance and particularly on the first. So there are several ways of addressing the concern. One of which, for example, is to is invite a second group of uh, um, analysts, if you like, statisticians, to explore the data. There are also issues that you need to think about about that is where do you get that second group of analysts from? Uh, do they actually understand all of the issues? Not all of which, it's not just a question of data, but it's also a question of how the whole study was co conducted and so on. So there's a whole range of things. And do they have their own uh, biases uh, and other, other um, motives? I mean, I've no idea. So those are, that's the second. Um, and the third is, just to come back to data sharing as a general principle, is that a privacy is beyond just anonymization. So it's not just do I take the names and addresses out, in particular circumstances, um, then privacy also extends to can you re-identify people from the data that you've got. Now from genetics, it's sort of obvious, you imagine it's sort of obvious that you can, you can, you pick up a genome and you can identify who it is because all of ours are more or less unique. Actually in reality that's quite hard, you see a genome walking down the street, you pick it up um, and you can work out the sequence, but unless you've got some other context information and you behave badly, you can't do it. But the privacy issues are also still there, that re-identification is in theory possible, and that comes back to the consent issue at the, at, at the very beginning. What was the understanding? So I think you know, uh, the search should be re reliable, robust, and defensible, and there should be mechanisms to allow that to happen. But the consent piece also needs to be um, upheld. That's why you got people in, that's why they trusted you to go into the, into the study. And, and that, that, to my mind, has, uh, uh, is the primary consideration until such point as you can really outweigh that, uh, that and, and argue that, that that has to be overturned. The ethicist and the patient voice are on my left. I'd be interested in their view. No, well, I, I also don't know anything about the case, actually. I would like to hear more uh, afterwards. Um, and no, I, I agree with the concerns that Martin um, raised in terms of consent. Um, one issue that I would like to add is the aspect of um, context um, in, uh, in doing research with large databases. And um, this is something that has been uh, studied by uh, several people doing like empirical studies showing how it is difficult to um, use, reuse data collected in a specific context with a specific research question or clinical goal in mind, which are two different things, and then reuse it for other type of research because um, some of that context gets lost. Um, and so this is um, one of the issues that also have to be considered. So how reusable is the, the, the data is and what's the point of re-accessing it, um, which is also one of the questions that have to be asked when that data is collect, collected. I think it's, um, it's really difficult when you see um, 
you know, you expect medicine to be evidence-based, and then there's a question about the evidence base, and then someone is unwilling to share information about that evidence with you, it, often the initial reaction to that would be to then go, well, what are they hiding? But I have to say I agree with the other end of the table that the initial consent that was given was given in a context for a reason, and so really that adding a secondary group of peer review um, to look at the, the data would probably be the best instance in that case, but as I said, I don't know anything about that situation either, but I can understand where the concern comes from, and I think that that's something that you would see in, in a lot of different cases, and particularly in, in a condition like ME, where there, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so, um, so Carol brought up this question about commercial institutions having access, and, I, and I, I'm particularly interested if anybody has anything to say about that as a limit, um, but other than that, is there any other people have it? Yeah. Yep, just here, and then, and then you. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Samara, and I run a program which is called Equator, which uh, helps researchers to share findings from their research projects, not only data, but through publications. And I think how I see this debate, we, we talk about data sharing, but what is important to say that there are different kinds of data, and as Mark suggests, sort of indicated, these comes with different type of information to be shared and different need for data protection. And one thing is access to our medical records which are fully identifiable and there are issues associated with this. And the other thing is access to data which come from research and then again you have different level of, of data. And those are slightly different issues and there are different purposes what we share data for. So I think that's important to distinguish in debate because you can't come up with one blank opinion or answer. You always have to link it to specific situation. Mm. And I think that hasn't been clarified enough for people to make up their mind. You can't say are you for or against it. There's the context. So, so, so thank you. So there, are, so there are different kinds of data that are for different kinds of purposes. Martin, does that cause a problem for big data? If we're going to have different hurdles and different things to get over, then we can't use it all together and do wonderful things? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, my, my perspective on this is that one uh, needs to move away from a model in which we think about data ownership and data location, which is really now largely false, um, and more to one about purpose and control. So, um, and, and that includes the commercial uh, uh, interest. Most of the new treatments that we use have had commercial involvement in them at some point. And if you really want to know whether they work, we have to work with commerce in order to, with the commercial sector, in order to make sure that we understand whether they work. And it would be, uh, uh, um, I think, unwise to assume that somehow charity or government are going to pick up those enormous uh, development costs. Um, but uh, one has to do, do, do have the data sharing or data access with the relevant purpose and the relevant controls. Um, for the sort of controls you want when your data, somebody down here was saying, you know, the data that the GP has being shared with the hospital or the A&E department, that's for a particular purpose where you would anticipate a certain level of controls. You'd expect the data didn't get lost somewhere on the way, which of course is what happens to letters uh, and other things. Uh, you'd expect those controls to be in place and you'd expect that it didn't get into, generally speaking, the wrong hands um, Jim's neighbour or whatever. That's one set of purpose, one set of controls. For how can I compare the performance of this hospital's A&E or this ho pa patients with particular diseases in this hospital versus another hospital, that's another purpose with another set of controls. Uh, and I think one, as one moves along the line, it always comes back to, so why are we why are we allowing those people to have access to the data? What's the purpose? What are they trying to do? And what are the controls? What are we saying they shouldn't do? Um, and one of the big things that, by and large, people don't want to happen, in general terms, is to be re-identified. They don't want it coming home to roost to them. So the issue about sharing data with insurance companies, let's think about that for a moment. So insurance companies build models about what's likely to happen to all of us and how long we're going to live and whether we're worth the, you know, how much they're going to charge us for that particular bet that basically we'll never claim. That's, that's how insurance companies work. And actually, if those models were better, that might actually be, have some overall advantage. 
And that can only be done on data, and they get their data by and large by the people who pay up for to be in part of those insurance companies. So I'm not arguing to share with data with insurance companies, but I'm just using it as perhaps the most hostile and aggressive. If, if the models get better, then I don't have, personally, I don't have quite such a problem with that. If they then get used my, to penalise me, they re-identify me, and they only re-identify me, they re-identify you and penalise you, and they re-identify you and penalise you, then I have a problem because they're stripping the data away and having the purpose being learn something new, get a better model, you know, work out a better system, they've suddenly come down to something which is re-identifying people and then adding, applying some sort of penalty or risk back to the person. So that re-identification is, I think, an important part of the control. And there are times when that re-identification is really helpful. Um, so, for example, uh, if you were doing um, genetic data and you looked at my genome and you were trying to study my rare genetic disorder, and then actually in order to need to do that, you actually emerged in lots of other people. And eventually, 10 years time, you came back to me and said, you know what, we've discovered something new. We're gonna re-identify you and, find, and tell you about it. That might be, might be a good thing. So sometimes it might be helpful, and there are times when that re-identification can be really harmful. And that's a, a key part to me of the controls. But to go back to it, I think it's purpose and controls, not where does the data sit. Um, if I ask any of you where actually are your emails, if actually if I ask any of you where actually are your GP records, I think you'd probably be surprised where, what the answers are. They're not physically in your GP surgery. They're, not, they're, they're out there in computer servers sitting somewhere where you can actually identify them ultimately. But you know, it's not about location, it's about purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question up here. Okay, sure. A bit further up. Thank you. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Wellcome Trust Center for um, Human Genetics. And I've got a question that's um, probably mainly for Jim and it's related to um, one of the four key goals of Genomics England, I think, which is um, to kickstart a genomics industry in the UK. Um, to do that, how feasible is it for very young companies that only consist of very few people and don't necessarily have a track record to actually get access to um, patient data, which is obviously very sensitive? So this comes down to um, where is your data? And the second part, now, now Martin ended by reiterating purpose, which is of course it's part of it. Everyone's saying the same thing here, actually, they're talking about context. It, uh, it is all relative. It isn't a yes, no answer. Um, you know, is your data safe and secure is one of the questions we're looking at. And the question is, well, you know, relative to what? You know, how safe? Is it appropriate? What are the controls? Now, when we come to the genomics England work, the, the approach that's been taken, um, and you, you can look at this as well for a lot of where we manage the data for care, is quite a conservative, cautious one. That information, actually we do know where it is, and it's going to be on specific servers. It's not going to, it's, you can think of it as in a private cloud, but cloud of this, utterly controlled and stays within England as it happens. And you might think geography is irrelevant in the age of the internet, but it absolutely isn't when it comes down to governance and control. Martin talked about re-identification. If you're going to give people, whoever, you know, for whatever purpose, access to record level data, so you've got specific pieces of information, then you are creating an opportunity if they have enough related information about that individual for them to re-identify. Now, you know, in my experience, most scientists don't have any interest whatsoever in, in re-identifying the subjects of their research. Now, maybe they should have more interest in those subjects, it's another debate, but they're just, they're not, they're not focused on that. That, of course, creates a risk because they're, they're, they're not really watching the identification, the identification. They're just saying, how can I do the science? Now, when we let People have access, and access is, is, is really what we should be thinking about. I quite like sharing, because you can think about oversharing, but access to this data. As the risks that come, as the value of these very detailed patient records and the genetic information increases, the amount of information about you increases, that increases the risks. But at the same time, 
the technology that's given us a chance to have this information in the first place has also given us the opportunity to manage it more securely. Because we can have more information about the researchers who are looking at it and what they do with it. We, so what we do with Genomics England is we have the data in a center and the researchers come to us. Now they come to us virtually, but every action they take, every access to the data, every piece of analysis is recorded. We can see who did what when. We, you know, it's, if you're going to give people that access, you can't stop, you can't completely eliminate the possibility of them re-identifying it. But if they do re-identify somebody and they attempt to take that, the fact of that re-identification out of our secure cloud, we'll have a record of them doing that and they're going to be in trouble. <laughs> and they're going to be in trouble because we have this governance framework around it. One, one example you might, might think of is Estonia. I don't know how many of you know even where Estonia is. It's a fantastic country. One interesting thing about it is all your data is in Estonian citizens linked. Your tax records, your medical records, everything. And it's accessible, not, not, not to people at random, but you know, it's possible that your local police commissioner can take a look. But the technology is there so that every access, every time somebody reads that, that fact has been recorded and accessible to the citizen. And you know, you're looking for the legislation as well as the culture and the informatics to, to make this okay. So if you're caught looking at data when you haven't got a legitimate reason, you go to jail. I'm not saying we should send the, the bright young things of these startups to jail if they're found doing the wrong thing, but you've got to understand the seriousness by which when we let one of these little commercial companies, brilliant innovators, have access to the data, it's going to be under a heavyweight regime of, you know, researchers need to take this very seriously, I'm sure you do. Now that means that getting things up to speed means you, you don't, somebody's got a brilliant idea, they've got a brilliant, just let us at the data, we'll do stuff. Well, I, I think we're moving out of that era into a more serious, well, okay, just as, if you, if you know about the way medics access medical records, every access is recorded. Uh, you know, talking about EPRs, every access is recorded. We're going to be moving towards that for, for research data as well, when it's at that level of identifying. Now, I know there's different levels of data, different. But if you're dealing with patient records in a research context, we have the same expectations about management. Now, getting there, ramping that up, means that if you're a small company and you want to come and have a look at this data, it, of course that's part of the goal. But we're not just going to say, look, here's a spreadsheet. Um, and it takes a while to get all of this infrastructure up and running. That's the intention, but you, you've got to get this extra layer of management around it. So that's a bit of a long answer. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. So, I mean, if I could just summarise that. Is the, so the idea is, is that security, safety and security is monitored in the same way as the users are monitored. So we can yeah. monitor what the users are doing with it as well. And that, and that seems like an interesting thing. I'll come to you in just a second. I just want to get Federica's comments on those sorts of security and safety issues. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, there are several aspects to it. And um, one is definitely the aspect of transparency of who has access. And, and as you rightly said, technology on the one hand is the problem and on the other hand could help with the solution. But it's not only the technologies, the way we, you know, the, the governance mechanisms that we have around it. Um, and other point that I wanted to make is um, what is important is also not only to know who has access, but also, again, talking about governance mechanisms, how do we, um, you know, what are the criteria to give access? And one point that I think it's important is not only about who can pay to have access, because, you know, if we talk about uh, uh, small and medium enterprises and companies, I mean, it is important that it's not only Google or Big Pharma or, you know, to, who, have, who have access to, to this data. Um, and, and then it's a matter again. That's why I'm saying it's a matter of governing. It's, uh, of course, you have the technical mechanisms for that, but then you also have to think about uh, we have to think about governance mechanisms. Mm. Gentleman here in the, what is it, fifth row. I think to solve this problem, we've got to address some of these issues of concerns by the 
by the patients, by the users. This is not helped by the way the insurance industry has behaved. Insurance was originally supposed to be, we're all in it together, and if you're unfortunate to have an accident, you get sorted out. That's what the old mutual societies were supposed to be. But insurance companies are going to this very selective process that you fit a particular profile, you get an insurance cost at half. And some people end up with uninsurable houses and uninsurable lives and so on. It's also not helped, I suggest, by the government allowing local authorities to sell the electoral roll. Admittedly, if you remember to tick the box that says your data won't be included, if you even realise you can do that, you can be kept out of it. But I think there's a big problem with perception here, um, not helped, of course, by uh, the hacking scene, that, uh, people, that people don't understand that actually those examples that are very in big publicity are probably a tiny, tiny fraction of what's going on. Mm. What does the panel think about mm. those issues? Jim? I'm going to be cheeky. I think, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm not that worried about the local authority in the electoral role. What worries me, and this is why, this is where you start moving out of the, the informatics um, being an obvious, the main part of the solution. It, don't underestimate the need for new technology to help you actually impose these governance frameworks. But the culture, the legislation, the ethics around this, we, we are only just starting to realize the need for some of it. I, I don't tell my GP, look, I, I, if you got my GP record, you'd find out a few embarrassing things about me, but not much. But if I think there's something wrong with me, I might Google for it. Google, Google know which devices I have, what is their the abilities, they know exactly where I live, they know my friends are, they don't, you know, I think, you know, worrying about the electoral role in the council is only part of it. We're looking for something of a revolution in, in how we manage data. And, and how we constrain this, um, I think. So it's before the other people. Yeah. At the I just wanted to jump in because it's interesting to me that, um, you know, what is it about our health records that we're so concerned about? Because if you think about some of the places we willingly give a lot of data to, for example, your Nectar card, that gives so much information to commercial companies about your lifestyle, about um, some of your um, diet, some of your health, therefore, perhaps, potentially. And then you also have things like Fitbit. So we're, we are actually sharing a lot of data willingly without thinking about it. So what's interesting to me, is it because of the chance that it goes to um, insurance companies? Is it about the fact that there is some kind of crux of who we are within our medical data that makes people additionally concerned? And in a way, isn't it nice that the medical community is actually entering into these debates and looking at the ethics, whereas some of the other organizations that seem as though um, it'd be fine to share information with have just collected your data without really telling you? Mm. Um, I wanted to, Carol, before we put that down, <laughs> um, I wanted to move on because this, this issue of what we know about what's being collected and, and what's being used in what way, as Martin's already spoken about it, this, this question about consent, that was a lot of the big issue in, in the care.data scandal. And part of that was about people not knowing. Um, and one of the solutions to that was this idea about opting in and opting out. I mean, did you have any thoughts about about that and how, whether or not that sort of model might apply in this kind of case. Before you can opt in or opt out, you have to understand what you're opting in and opting out of. And I think with care.data that wasn't clear because it was so poorly communicated. People didn't really understand what their information was going to be used. In a way, do we understand what is our medical record? So mm -hmm. are you giving away blood pressure data? Are you giving away date of birth? What is it that you're telling people? So I think we need to actually have the debate at a level where people you know, can engage with it. And I don't think that happened with care data. It's just, oh, you know, of course we want to send that off. You'll help save lives. And if you don't, oh, that's a bit you know, naughty. And that, that, that's kind of the level it seemed to come across to a lot of patients. Um, we had a debate about care.data before, and a lot of the concerns were, you know, I don't know where this is going. I don't know what it's for. And, you know, a previous experience, perhaps, of seeing large data sets end up on trains by um, ministers might make people worry about what happens. And 
So, so, how, so how do you think we can we get around that? I mean, how, how do we un, how do we make the public and patients understand the sorts of things that Martin wants to do with the data? I think you have to understand that uh, you know there's a level of health literacy of the public that is different from the medical community, and I think you need to communicate at the level of literacy that people are at. So you need to explain things in a way that they can understand, and it is a different language, and there's a lot of jargon when it comes to that. Um, medical records and data and there are a lot of people who are really clued up because they've spent a lot of time in the system you know working on it and they know but there are also a lot of people from my, myself for example who have never been in a hospital you know um, other than to go speak to patients but you know <laughs> for a medical reason and, and so maybe perhaps I don't have the knowledge or the terminology or the mm -hmm. understanding of what you might even collect mm -hmm. and what you might hold on me at all so I think it's making sure that we have a debate that's clear and open and so people know what they're getting into and then to leave the decision to them ultimately um, and, and to you know, extol the benefits. Mm -hmm. Federica. Uh, thanks. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree in that we need to, that, that, you know, that information has to be clearly communicated but I, I don't think it's only a matter of uh, health literacy, although I agree it's very important, but um, it is a matter, as, and, and the point has been raised, we are also very often talking about data in general, and as we said, there are different types and different uses. Um, and, you know, one of the dilemma is to, I mean, how to, you know, how to f it's, it's a matter of a balance between, on the one hand, recognizing that there are different purposes and making clear what these purposes are. But on the other hand, we don't want to have specific consent for one specific, specific purpose because then research becomes um, impossible. And there is no point to have so much data if then you can, you know, you cannot, cannot all these databases can be used by, um, by other researchers. So this is, this is really hard, and as has been pointed out, we are, you know, starting, um, lagging behind a little bit, uh, resonating, resonating about novel ways of governing and novel ways, novel ways, maybe informed consent, some authors said, well, that's, that's not the way to go. Uh, we should think about other mechanisms, and, well, I know I don't have a, an ultimate solution for that, but what I'm saying is, I don't think it's only a matter that it was communicated badly in a difficult way for the public, although I agree with that, um, but that's, not, that's only part of the problem. The other problem is that it was unclear how, how this data would be used and what was it. Not because it was a difficult language, but because we are still struggling with how to do it. I think there's also a bit of a quid pro quo. You know, the UK holds one of the largest data set of patient experience data in the world in the National Survey Program. Um, they question 80,000 patients a year about their, um, about their experience in hospital. And over the last 10 years of that program, they have very effectively managed the status quo. And there are about five changes in patient experience that um, have occurred in those 10 years and they have been entirely transactional. So people have got more letters on time. Hospitals have become a bit cleaner and people have got more written instructions about what to do with their medications. People haven't become nicer to patients. People have not uh, learned to communicate better with patients. And I think so you, it's this idea that patients have often willingly given information and then seen nothing happen from it and no material benefit from having given that information. So perhaps if we were to do a little bit more with some of the information that we hold of patients and actually give some benefit, they might be more willing to share their data. Mm. Thank you. We, we need to get some last comments, that's right. Martin, could I get you to say something briefly about this consent issue? Yes, I think... Um I think the first is to think at which point you, you, you draw the line for consent. I think I, my one word on care.data would be disaster. You couldn't have done it, ba it more badly. Um, uh, but I think there's, there are two pieces. One is how can you join the data together? And putting barriers in the, in the way of being able to join the data together is incredibly unhelpful and damaging, whether it's 
uh, from the GP to primary care, or it's across hospitals. Uh, because if one puts the consent barrier at the point of, I don't want the data to leave X, first of all, um, you can never do sensible things that you should do at scale, like what are the rates of uh, survival from breast cancer surgery across all the surgeons in the UK. You just can't do it because the worst surgeons won't put their data in. Uh, uh, so those are the sort of things you have to be able to join the data. So the data have to move to allow that sort of stuff to happen. The second is I'm, I'm always really worried uh, about um, imposing consent models which might disadvantage the most needy. I think it's quite easy to come up with consent models that satisfy, um, that are overly interpreted or applied, which might serve many of those who contribute to the development of those models, and I'm looking around, they, that includes the people in the room, but which might not serve the most needy. Um, if one thinks about um, uh, those whose English is not their first language, who are not, haven't got either great literacy, let alone health literacy, those who are immigrant populations, those who've got mental health issues, the list of children, the list goes on and on. That actually if one puts in, and you have to sign a consent form in the first place, in order to be able to, for us to be able to do something sensible, that's really unhelpful and I think damaging to, to individuals' health. And then I think at the last moment, the question becomes around transparency. There are some really good things, the health survey data is an example, but there are lots of other really good things that come out of sharing the data and bringing it together. And we need to make much more of that. And my, my experience from research projects, big research projects, has been when patients or participants see the value of what they've contributed. They only see the data, they need to see the value of what's been contributed um, come back, in, here is a new finding, here is a new treatment, here is something new that's happened, because, here is a new project that's going across because of your participation. That actually people have found is really, really rewarding. And I would keep the consent piece, but I would keep it for specialist circumstances, and that's, not, that's still a lot, um, but I think you have to get to a point where you can actually do, you bring data together and do many of the really sensible and I think <coughs> largely essential things that need to happen. Great, thanks very much. I need to bring this to a close. Um, we have important people speaking shortly. Um, more important people, if you can believe that. Um, but what I'd like each of our panellists to do is to give us a sentence or two about what we've been talking about. But I think with particular focus on that learning the lessons from care.data for research in the future in Oxfordshire. Jim, we start with you, just because you're there. Just because I'm here. We need, so my, my, I, I, I just think Martin's put it very nicely actually. We need more data sharing, better data sharing, and we need more controls. And we need more investment in those controls, not just to stop the data moving from, from A to B when it shouldn't, but also to make sure that when it turns up in a different context, in a different setting, it's properly understood, it's properly used, and that we have this feedback, this transparency, so we understand what's going on. Martin? Uh, we have a duty to learn from everything we do in medicine. Um, uh, the use of data is, is, is no exception to that. But we also have a responsibility to do so in a way that respects uh, the patients and the, and the public who contribute to that. And that is a two-way responsibility. One is looking after whatever it is that you entrust us with. And the second is using it to the best of our, of our ability to give new information and reliable information back. And it's a two-sided coin. Both elements are important. Federica? Well, uh, make the point again that we, should, we need to move beyond the sharing metaphor. And, um, uh, yeah, and, and you know, the, 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 the moral connotations that come with it and really understand what, that we're talking about access and what that, what that means. Um, and that we need to be um, creative in thinking about governance mechanisms uh, that have to be in place and that that can help um, mm. dealing with this. Mm. Right, thanks. Carl? I think once you've sorted out the governance and the sharing protocols, you should figure out how to get those records between organisations that people might need to attend as well. So it should be, it's not just kind of research versus the everyday. I think we need to learn the lessons in terms of sharing things within hospital wards, for example. Mm. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming along and for your questions and attention. Um, enjoy the rest of the open day. Thank you again. Can you join me in thanking the panel? Thank you.